Thank you, everyone. And would you all pray with me, please? Most holy and loving God, it is a privilege to be in this holy space again this day where we may hear your word proclaimed once more, sing beautiful songs in your name, and seek your blessing upon us. And I ask, dear Lord, that you do pour out your blessings upon each and every person here this morning, that we may continue to grow in your love. In Christ's name we pray, amen. 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 You know, years ago, if you were driving along the turnpike system in Pennsylvania, every few miles there'd be a great big billboard that listed the following information. What the speed limit was along that part of the highway and for how many more miles that would apply. So you knew. But then right underneath that was a list of all the different penalties you could incur if you broke the speed limit. So say the speed limit was 60 miles an hour, and you were caught going 65 miles an hour, well, your fine would be $50, but no points against your license. Well, if you were caught going 70 miles an hour, then the fine would go up to $100, and you'd get one point against your license. And if you were caught going 70 miles, 75 miles an hour, the fine doubled to $200, and you got three points against your license. And finally, anything over 75 miles an hour, you were arrested, fined $1,000, and your license would be suspended or even taken away from you. When I used to see these signs on our family trips that we took each summer from Maryland to Maine, I was not yet old enough to drive myself, and my father was not someone to go over the speed limit. But some of my older brothers would tell me that when they drove along that turnpike, they would go through and do the mental calculations on how fast they could go based upon, one, their perceived risk of actually getting caught, and two, how much of a penalty they could afford if they were caught. (laughs) I don't know if any of that's true or not. I wasn't allowed to ride with them. But... um, (laughs) Well, anyway, I I got to thinking this week that that is exactly how a lot of people view God and all those commandments in the Bible. And if you break one or some or all of them, well, that is what is called sin, and God is going to mete out some punishment against you. You There is a stated baseline somewhere in the Bible And if you go over that line, here's what happens. You know, column A, column B type of thing. And there are plenty of people who can point to actual verses in Scripture that give exactly those kinds of descriptions. And those lists of things to do and not to do and some of those what we call Old Testament books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus and actually Genesis and Numbers as well, the first five books of the Bible that that are collectively known as the Torah or the law, the Jewish law. Well, you know, some of those Old Testament laws are still widely picked over and chosen and held to be true for many Christians. For instance, the Ten Commandments. Many a Christian would say those are still important and true. But the Ten Commandments are only one sixtieth of the 613 commandments that are listed out in the Torah for people to read. I mean, what happened to the other 603 if we only have to look at ten? You know, this week, we are right smack in the middle of Lent. Three weeks in, 
three weeks to go. And the themes, the scriptural themes for this midway point are the theological concepts of sin and suffering and redemption and hope. We are now on the down ramp toward Holy Week and Good Friday where sin and suffering are nailed to a cross and left to die. And then Easter, where redemption and hope rise from the grave of human suffering and are eternally promised to all of those who would believe. So I would think that it is rather important that we examine these themes and try to understand how they still apply to our lives some two, three, or in some cases, 4,000 years after these billboards in the Bible were first written down. I mean, why don't we, as Christians, follow all 613 commandments? Well, spoiler alert, Jesus broke all those commandments down into simply two. When he says in the Gospels, that the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And there's a second one like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Just two. On these two commandments, Jesus says, all the others depend, and no other commandments can be greater than these. So which is it? Ten commandments? Two commandments? Or still 613 commandments? Or, what a lot of people do, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. (laughs) Well, who gets to decide then if it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that? I mean, if we say we are followers of Jesus and therefore there are only two commandments, great, I'm right there with you. I can remember two. The only difficulty is they're not very specific. And we like specifics. Is it black or is it white? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Is it four? Is all homosexual behavior condemned to the fires of hell? Or was that referring to something completely different? And that same sex and same gender love was not addressed in the Bible at all. Of course, on that same line of thinking, are all extramarital relations condemned to those same fiery furnaces of hell? You know, because the biblical word that often gets mistranslated into like homosexual is that one that you have fornication. You know that great word in the Bible, fornication. Well, that, that just means all sex outside of marriage. You know, it's pretty all-encompassing. It's not gay or straight. It doesn't matter. If it's outside of marriage, you're fornicating and you're going to hell. Column A, column B. Well, then let's go back to love God and love your neighbor. But how? Again, there's a lot of people who will say, you know what, maybe we do need those Ten Commandments after all. That they are still valid in forming some sort of ethical foundation for our society and the basis of our own moral compasses. That was a good sentence. That sounds good, right? Phew, well that should settle it. Jesus is two and the ten. So really twelve. Except those same examples I just gave that people love to still pick out and shove into our faces, they're not covered in those two or ten commandments. They're scattered about in the other 603. Now what? Well, if you haven't decided this already, this is where it gets tricky. Because we all know people who will say, you know, Some things are just obvious, John. 
And it should be obvious that commandment number 212, 316, and 411 are the obvious ones, and that those are the ones that we should be following, especially you. To which I would normally reply, huh, not obvious to me. I kind of like the ones about people who farm the land having to leave 10% of their fields unharvested so that the poor can go and get something to eat for free. Wouldn't ConAgra love that? <laughs> and while I certainly would not want this to actually happen, let me say that loudly, I would not want this to happen, but there is a commandment that says children who sass their parents, talk back to their parents, should be taken outside the town gates and stoned to death in front of everybody. Yikes. All right, bring it back down a little. There's also a commandment that says you should not travel more than one mile anywhere on the Sabbath. And how many of us would not be able to be here today? <laughs> or pretty much anywhere on Sunday if we couldn't go more than a mile from our home? You probably had to walk, too. Well, they didn't have cars. <laughs> so not so obvious, is it? Don't eat shellfish. It's an abomination. Don't eat pork. I don't see Nancy Freiberg, but I know she's planning to serve ham on Easter Sunday here. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I put ham in the green beans today for brunch. So if, you don't eat por so if you actually don't eat pork products, you might want to skip the green beans today. There's also a whole stick of butter in that pot, but I've been living in the South for eight years, so I am trying, okay? <laughs> Ham and butter. So what's the answer? What's the answer? And where is the answer? And who gets to tell you which answers? I mean, think about it. If we just say, let's keep the Ten Commandments. Those are good. There's one that says, honor thy mother and thy father. Well, great. We should honor our parents and all of our elders. But how? Does honor my mother and father mean I just talk nicely to them? Can I talk badly behind their backs? What does honoring, meaning, honoring them mean ensuring that they are not dropped off in some less than sanitary housing facility to look after them in their later years instead of us? I mean, the fact of the matter is there will be as many definitions of sin and subsequent suffering as there are people seeking to define sin and their idea of the appropriate punishment. And one of, our Bible, one of our Bible study members this week said this. When someone did something wrong in our family, we just called it a mistake. Your family, it was a sin. <laughs> well, I would, like to, I would like to approach this topic and provide an answer for it from the other direction. Not starting with lists of sin and sufferings, but the other twin themes of redemption and hope. When the disciples asked Jesus if, if some people, first some, some non-Jewish people, had, you know, who had suffered these torturous deaths on their Pontius Pilate, was it because they were worse sinners than everyone else that they suffered these tortures? <clears throat> Certainly not, Jesus says. Well, then they ask, well, what about these other people who were Jewish, like them? Did they die in that freak accident when the tower fell on them because they had sinned against God? Why only 18? Maybe there was 30 people standing around. Why didn't they all get crushed? Were they worse, worse people? Certainly not, Jesus said. And he, but then he followed it up with this. But if you don't start changing your own ways, you're going to die just like them. 
And then he went, went on and told a parable. He could have stopped there because that was kind of a heavy-duty thing to say, but he goes on to say there was a, a fig tree that wasn't producing any fruit and how the owner of the tree wanted to dig it up, get rid of it. But the gardener said, no, wait, give it another year. Just give it one more year and I'll take extra care of it and fertilize it and, and hopefully that'll do the trick and we'll get some figs off it next year. See, the disciples were asking about sin and punishment because that is what they, ha they had been taught. But at the same time, it seems they were wondering, is that really true? You know, is it really true, Jesus, that these people were worse somehow? Does a tower fall on people and kill them because they were sinners? Did Pontius Pilate, you know, who was a really ruthless despot, murder some Galileans because they were sinners, or, or was it because he was a ruthless despot? And Jesus told them, no, 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 no. They did not die because of these horrible deaths because God, God had chosen them out of everyone else because they were worse sinners than everyone else. That that is not how it works. Instead, God seeks to bring people closer by loving and nurturing and, and giving it just one more year, just like the gardener in the parable. And that when Jesus told his disciples that they would die just like these others had, if they didn't change their own ways, well, I really don't think Jesus was saying that a tower was going to fall on them if they didn't change their ways, or that they would be murdered because they broke a law under Pontius Pilate. I think what he was saying was, stop with this billboard attitude of who gets, punish who gets what punishment based on what crime or sin or misdemeanor they committed. I'm telling you that all you need to worry about is loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you need help figuring out what that means, come talk to me, he said. That's why I've come. Yes, there should be some obvious things in life. Like, like, be kind to people. Oh, don't kill people. Feed them when you can. And don't deny them food when you can't. Help out in some other way. Stop cherry-picking some old laws that were written down thousands of years ago, and instead use your head and your time to think about what it means to love God and your neighbor. In other words, stop condemning and start loving. Even if it kills you. Figurative, figuratively or literally. I was talking this past week with someone who was part of a, a, a local production company, puts on plays and things, and, and they're doing a play of, of what it's like to be openly gay in Wilmington. And so they came and asked the openly gay pastor in Wilmington, one of us, <coughs> of a Christian church, and came and interviewed me. And it was a great interview. I mean, I really enjoyed talking to this young college-aged woman who was actually overjoyed to learn that something like St. Jude's exists in Wilmington. We need to start talking more, I guess. She's like, I live five minutes down the street. I didn't even know you were here. Anyway, one of the questions she asked was, what would I say to someone who called me or met me for the first time and asked about what I thought about their sexuality and what they had been taught in their young lives about the sinfulness of their whole being because of that and how there was no way that they could be part of God's plan? What would I say to someone? And I told her I hope I would say the following. As a matter of fact, I need to cut this out and tell people that you are wonderfully made and beautifully created. And that, yes, there are many voices in the world who would try to put conditions on that, some over here and some over there, but the only voice you ever need to listen to 
is the one that says, I knew you before you were even born. I'm the one who knit knit you together in your mother's womb. So I know you and I love you. All the great prophets of the world speak of God's love, and, and Jesus Christ, whom I follow, said that what God intends for you is a a full and abundant life. Abundant with happiness, abundant with joy, abundant with grace, and abundant with compassion. And that the world can indeed be a very noisy place. And that you should just learn to listen to the voice inside of you. And remember that the only label that matters is made in the image of God. Redemption and hope. None of us are perfect. And we can all use some spring cleaning in our lives. And that is exactly what the season of Lent is for. You do not need to condemn yourself or allow others to do that for you. I mean, the purpose of Lent, indeed the the, the purpose of our entire lives, but we're reminded every Lent, is to seek ways to make more room in our lives for God. So take a good look and see if there are things that that we are doing or, or that we are not doing that would facilitate that. And then, try really hard to do it. And not, beat up, and not beat ourselves up if it doesn't happen on the first try, or, or even the second, or even the third. The point is to keep trying with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And know that Jesus still stands here to say, say, saying, I will never give up on you. For I know that you are wonderfully made and that I love you now just as much as I have since before you were even born. And that nothing can ever separate that love that is between us. My friends, allow your your souls to yearn for God just as much as God's heart yearns for each of you. And in the end, even if that is all we ever accomplish in life, you can expect to see the one who came to give, to give us life and to say in our death, welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of the Lord. Amen. 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 Will you pray with me, please? Holy God, your love is truthful. Give us the insight to speak the truth in love and for the sake of your kingdom and not out of a need to appear clever or right. Your love is not quick-tempered. We pray for those who are angry and violent and for their victims, for children who fear elders who are abused and people trapped in relationships that injure and harm. Your love bears all things. We remember before you those with heavy burdens, many cares, much stress, and just too little comfort and help. Allow them to seek their comfort in your holy arms, which never fail to reach and to hold us. For even death does not trespass on the breadth and the depth of your love. And so we thank you for those we have loved in this life and who now dwell in the peace and joy of your presence. Comfort those who are bereaved today and bring us all closer to the one who is peace and in whose name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now, my friends, 
allow us to sit just in a moment of silence and allow the Holy Spirit of God to work within us.